Okay, great. So welcome everyone to the Food Tech Pitch Night hosted by the Startup Club. Uh, let's uh, wait a little a minute or so uh, until the last people connect and uh, then we can start our evening. Uh, so in the meanwhile, if you want, you can leave your contact details in the chat. Um, and uh, let's start in, uh, in uh, half a minute. Okay, so I think we can start now. So once again, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I have shared the, the board members in the chat and I will be sharing uh, also the decks to the presenters in a, in a little uh, while. And um, uh, so one, I would like to welcome everyone. And my name is Mathilde and I, I am a, a host of Pitch Nights an investment conference at the Startup Club uh, on different topics. I focus on uh, food tech, but also fashion, beauty, and green tech. And for a few words about the Startup Club, we, we help connect fundraising startups to investors and advisors that can help them on their fundraising journey. And we do so by organizing pitch night events and also private meetings, uh, one-to-ones with investors. And uh, we also help uh, startups uh, with their pitch decks. So we, we do reviews. Uh, we also do uh, valuation reports of companies and valuation workshops. And as we offer also several promotional activities uh, like marketing, uh, marketing packages. And we have like everything is listed on our webpage. Uh, we are proud to have over 70,000 members in our online networks and uh, over 50,000 investors around the world. Today's event is focusing on innovative food tech companies, and I am happy to introduce you to two companies from the US and from the UK. So we have two today. The first one is called Blue Dot International, and it's a clean alternative protein company that is combining food technology and culinary expertise. And it is presented by Pamela Tusi uh, from New York. The second one is called Weekly, and it is presented uh, by Paul Cook. And it's an online grocery with no packaging waste. So yeah, we are welcome Pamela and Paul. Uh, let's, uh, I'm sorry. What is happening? I'm trying to share. <clears throat> okay. Were <laughs> you doing that? Oh, okay. Uh, no, 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 no. That's fine. I just I got a little bit. Oh, well, go ahead. Surprised. <laughs> Mine's not. No, yeah. no problem. Um, okay. Um, and where were where was I? Yeah. So the format is a ten minute speech followed by. 20 to 30 minutes q a with board members so uh, since we are only two companies we can take our time we just think it's it's nice so um, and uh, also if someone in the audience has a question you can use the the chat or, or the public chat or private message to the presenters and also i will be sharing the contact list after the event so that will be shared and uh, now to the board members, uh, we have four of them, and I will ask them to short shortly introduce themselves. Uh, we have um, Jasmine Baran from Eleven Ventures. We have Adrien Villalonga from Big Idea Ventures. We have Juan Ignacio Zafora from EIT Food, and Owen Zamit from Pig Bridge VC. Really happy to have you here on my second event. <laughs> 
Uh, most of you are already know from my first food tech, so I'm really happy to have you again. Uh, so let's start with ja Yasmin. So would you like to introduce yourself first? Yeah, thank you for the invite, uh, Mathilde, first. Uh, it's really exciting to be here. I am Yasemin. I am an investment associate in Eleven Ventures. As Eleven Ventures, we are investing in early stage companies in uh, food tech, healthcare, uh, future of work, also including AI there, and obviously sustainable food uh, nowadays. Um, I am a food engineer. I did my master's degree on uh, winemaking and viticulture. I worked in the labs to, you know, develop some strains as well. So basically, I have the general knowledge of the uh, food industry. So it made sense for us to, you know, come together with Eleven Ventures to um, bring our power together. Uh, me on the more scientific part and Eleven in the uh, more VC part. And now we are trying to find. Uh, startups ideas that we can support uh, in general. Uh, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, let's uh, hear about Adrian. Yes, thanks, uh, Mathilde, and uh, thanks a lot also for, for inviting me to the to this session. Um, so I'm Adrian. I'm a part of the investment team at uh, Big Eddie Ventures. Uh, my background is mostly around uh, business and, and finance. Um, and I've been in the company for around two years now when they opened an office in, in Europe. And uh, Big ID Ventures, uh, so we're a venture fund and accelerator specialized in, in uh, ag tech and food tech. So I'll be working more on the, on the food tech parts. And on, on the food tech parts, we invest in um, two markets, so alternative proteins and what we call alternative ingredients. So in alternative proteins, it's going to be everything linked to the plant-based markets, uh, to fermentation or to cultivated meats. And then on the ingredient side, it's going to be mostly around um, alternatives to sugar, alternatives to um, products that are, that are sourced in an unsustainable way. So, for example, coffee, cacao, um, and also functional uh, ingredients. Um, and then we're an early stage venture fund, so we invest um, in uh, pre-seed companies for our accelerator and then in seed uh, to series A companies uh, directly. Perfect. Thank you so much. Welcome. Okay, and let's hear about uh, Juan. Sure. Good afternoon. How are you? Good afternoon. Hi. I'm, I'm good. How are you? <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Well, I am Juan. I'm regional startup manager of EIT Food. I'm EIT Food is European Institute of Technology uh, dedicated in the, for the food sector. In Europe, we like to say that we are the biggest community of agri-food companies in the world. We have most of the European startups and companies in our organization are associated to our one organization. And my role there is to manage the two, two of, the, of some of the early stage startup programs that we have. One is called TeamUp, which is a venture builder for Southern and Eastern Europe. And the other one is Seedbed Incubator. I manage mission one, which is a healthier lives through food. So I I support startups uh, under that mission as well. So lovely to be here, Mathilde, once again. Great, thank you so much. And uh, let's uh, hear now about uh, oh, how Owen. Hi, Owen. Hi, Mathilde. Thanks for the invite once again. Nice to be here. Um, so I'm Owen. I'm based in Malta at the moment. I'm a senior analyst at Peakbridge. and I've been here for two years. So we are a food tech focused venture firm. Uh, we have a remote team across Europe and Israel, and uh, we invest uh, in food tech startups between seed to series B stages, usually focusing on Europe, Israel, and the US. Those are kind of our primary markets and typically investing only in companies with a proprietary tech element, um, and we don't invest in ag tech, so purely food. Uh, my background is also from science, so it's nice to see Yasmin, uh, fellow, fellow people from, from the space. I've studied molecular biology, worked in healthcare diagnostics as well for four years, but was always interested in kind of the applicative side of science and started to move away from, from purely being in the lab. And VC is a wonderful space to be just that and meeting technical founders on a daily basis. So very happy to be here and, and looking forward to the two pitches. Thank you. Great. 
great introductions, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, yeah, so now after this uh, roundtable, we can uh, go right into it. And we will start with the first pitch with uh, Pamela Tuzi from Blue Dot In International. So welcome, Pamela. And when you're ready, you can share your screen and you can start the pitch. <clears throat> thank you, everybody, for coming and having me. Excuse me. <clears throat> and thank you, Matilda, especially for all your help. And we will, OK. screen. I don't know what's I'm so sorry. I'm sharing my screen. Can you guys see anything? Yes, I, I can see. Not, uh, not anymore. Try again. Okay. I can see your Zoom uh, page. <laughs> well, you don't want that. Um, so now you have to select the the deck uh, in the, you have it in a um, website or no no I, I'm, this is I, that's why I was a little bit late because we were having some tech issues this morning if you want I can share it but then you have to tell me when I should okay. switch the page yeah, yeah sure I don't want to waste people's time I apologize no problem very odd okay okay well, once again, thank you, everybody, for um, uh, coming here. And again, Matilda, thank you for the invite. Um, Blue Dot International <clears throat> is an alternative protein company that focuses on sustainability and uh, clean, uh, creating clean products. Um, and that's where we get our, our tagline, you'll love what it is and what it's not even more. Because when plant-based products started coming out pretty much around the pandemic, they were put out, believe it or not, by big meat companies. And they were funding startups. And a lot of the products ended up being not that great tasting, not healthy, and very expensive. So um, I, I, I took a look at this and said, gee, what can we do about it? So just to give you <clears throat> a little background on myself and why I got this started, it's like, everyone wants to know, why did you start this? So, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been plant-based uh, for about seven years now. And um, um, a few years back, I was treated for asthma and I wasn't getting better. And by the time I got to the right doctor, I was in stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And my oncologist said, after all these tests and getting the blood tests, I said, she said, the way that I ate literally saved my life because I was 90 days away from hospice because it was a very aggressive cancer. So it, it kind of, I got a message about food. You know, food is very powerful. Uh, food is medicine actually. And food is uh, definitely good for your lifestyle. So when I was going through all of this, I was thinking, what can I do? Because that was a very powerful message. Uh, what can I do to bring healthy, um, tasty, fun, uh, plant-based food to the market? So, and, and wanted it inclusive to everybody. So whether you're a flexitarian, a vegan, or, or, or someone who just ate meat all the time, no problem. So I, uh, um, working with a par uh, partnering with a company that has founded 57 different technologies in ferment the fermentation process of, of shiitake mycelia. And what that does is it makes it a complete protein. Okay. And so I know fermentation, I've been working with this for a few years now, but fermentation is a big deal. And it's like a lot of people do associate fermentation in a very positive way. Um, because it is, it's very good for your gut. It makes, it's very versatile, it's clean, it's responsibly sourced. Um, and the other thing that people are concerned about now, rightfully so, are, are uh, carbon footprints. This has a negative carbon footprint. Um, and actually fungi, because we, you know, this is the thing that I, I, when I present, I make sure that I really stress, we're talking about the roots of the mushroom, the actual mycelia, those little roots you can see underground and not the mushroom itself. Not, and that's the fruit. Um, and so, yeah, thank you, uh, Matilda. And so what are the, the benefits of this? Again, it, a clean and complete protein, okay? Um, which means it's, it's vital for our gut health, it improves flavor, enhances food texture, it boosts nutrition. And again, it's restorative to the soil and it's sustainable, which is something that we're, um, we, we advocate. Next, Matilda. 
still okay so as i kind of mentioned really we're addressing a problem um on, on in the, the plant-based market um there's too many additives high in sodium high in saturated fats it's also limited in variety there's not a lot of SKUs available um it, they're hard to find and they are i don't know in the european market but they're obscenely expensive here i mean it's 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 very very it's, it's cost prohibitive for most people to even eat plant-based and then and then on top of it our research shows that about 90 percent of the plant-based products out there are made from soy and so we're coming along as again a new alternative protein that's clean and sustainable covid what covid did was it took people and they started focusing more on their health. Um, and that's a core driver now for consumers. So our products, again, we are, we are pioneering the use of fermented mushroom mycelia because it's clean, it's sustainable. And the most important thing, which you can see in a minute, how versatile it is, okay? Uh, we also use, we use healthy uh, ingredients for when you come and you read um, the ingredients, you're gonna understand what it is. It's gonna say, fermented brown rice, fermented pea protein, fermented shiitake mushroom, um, and, and flavorings that you'll, you can understand. Um, we also, we're, we're the first ones that we're creating shelf stable uh, ready meals, and we'll get to that in a minute, minute, but also refrigerated and frozen options are gonna be available too. We're also gonna be competitively priced, okay? So what makes us different, and I really need to emphasize all of this, that it's the mycelia that we're using. And I did a lot of research on this a couple of years worth. And these roots, they have their own communication system. It's very sophisticated, but they're super healthy for the soil, but they are, they're like, they're rock stars in, in, in protein. Um, and then the company I'm working with it, like I said, they have, and this is where the technology comes in. And this is what separates the mycelia that we're using, different from other ones out there, mushrooms or mycelia is the fermentation process again i said with it's got 57 patents on it and um and again it is a fermented protein and it comes that way okay so next all right so when i talked about versatility in the shelf stable frozen and refrigerated um we're, we've created the first shelf stable medi uh, ready meal i spent from or Blue Dot, we spent from May to June working with Cornell University and their, their food agriculture, their food scientist department. And the project was to create a taco meal kit um, using the mycelia and we supplied the ingredients and they did it, it was amazing. So uh, all of, all of uh, taco meal kits are made from corn tor tortilla. So, um, so we're, we're, that's the first thing that we'd like to launch. Uh, we've also curated um, nuggets. That was the first thing we did because one of our missions too is to help underserved communities. Um, we have a strong belief that especially children, no one should be hungry, nobody. So uh, we did the we did the nuggets and we're hopefully gonna be, we're working with the New York City school system to launch them. But I wanted you to kind of get an idea of how versatile uh, this particular protein can go, okay? Um, next. All right, so when I'm talking about, you know, what makes us unique too, it's not what's really necessarily what's in it, but what's not. So we're just doing, we did a case study, the chicken nuggets that we've made. Um, and if you, you can see the ingredients that the leading plant uh, protein or plant-based uh, companies put out. So we have 12 ingredients, okay? And then you can see it ranges anywhere from 21 to 50 ingredients. And this is just for a chicken nugget. That's how many ingredients are are in these nuggets, and not only what that, that there's a lot of them, but what's in them too as well. So we're vegan, we're gluten free, um, but again, uh, I like to say we're clean. So anybody anybody uh, can eat these because you know why they taste good, and that's what our taste and texture is king. And so I, I don't want these people to look at these and say, these are plant-based products and it's clean, whatever. The people are gonna buy it because it's tasty and it's affordable and they're gonna come back. And we also uh, do not, the leading allergens, um, all those, we, we, none of those are included in our products as well. So for those people with allergies. Okay, so who's buying this? Who's buying plant-based? Okay, and we um, basically, if you wanna go by generation, it's very in, in, interesting. Um, Gen X and older millennials, over half of the purchases, okay? 
But boomers and retirees, that's a third um, because people are aging younger. Um, I happen to be a boomer and, um, and I can say that we're, they're more active and they also have the discretionary dollars in some cases where uh, um, that they can afford to buy these, um, but that won't be the case for us. And then the, the key and most interesting thing is the Gen Zers, the teenagers, the young, the younger ones, they're very, very concerned about sustainability. Uh, they are vegans and they are telling mom and dad to go out and buy these type of products because there is a social consciousness now, believe it or not, to buying food. Uh, and sustainability is another driver as well. Education, over half of them have college degrees. And then ethnicity here, at least in the United States, this survey is just in the United States. Um, it, the, it, the purchasing groups are Caucasians, Hispanics, African-Americans and Asians. So there's a large swath of different cultural people that are buying plant-based because food is very cultural. Um, I'm half Italian, I'm half Swiss. And um, I learned the, the, the food from, because both my grandparents were immigrants. So I think it's uh, important that we also are addressing a multicultural uh, market. Um, and then of course the income, that, that, that's again, the United States, okay. Thank you. Okay, so our business model is, we're initially, first of all, we're, we're initially going to launch uh, in Europe. We're going to start in Denmark. Um, we have a we have a relationship with a big uh, a big company out, out there, and um, and we're also going to start out with e-commerce as well. And these are the ways we're going to do it. We're also going to go food service. Um, we're we're talking with Google and Disney right now, uh, who are very interested in these. So here are these other target areas in in um, uh, food service, which is corporate schools. Again, we are um, we are in talks with the mayor of New York City uh, because he is plant based, and um, we're actually going to be going there and giving him a, a, a taste test of uh, our nuggets and a couple of our our, our Tex Mex, um, and to work to get these into the New York City schools uh, in 2024. Uh, if you looked at the New York City school district as a city in the United States, it would be the tenth largest city. So that's a, um, and we're going to be helping out children, which I'm, I'm, I'm very dedicated to. And then there, our second phase, we're going to go into group purchasing organizations and then retail. Um, the one contradiction I will say here with our e-commerce, there is a, uh, there are e-commerce vegan lines. So I would, I would say that would be considered, you could consider that retail because we'll get that out to people. So that's our business model. Okay, now here we're here are the people that we're working with. Okay, as far as distribution and packaging, uh, we have global food sales specialists. Um, we, again, we had had the joint venture with um, Cornell University, and I'd like you to just take a look at James Corwell, CNC, the plant-based culinary expert. Uh, James Corwell is a uh, Certified master chef. There's only 72 of them in the United States. And if you can think about how many chefs are in the United States, and he's the one that signs off on our taste and our texture. So there's a very high bar that we're that we're reaching. Um, and here's here are the other our our co-man um, and our product development people. It it took quite a while to find a company that could work with Massilia. So. Um, and Planet Tears also. I met with the at Plant Based World Expo. I met with the head of um, uh, product development. She's a, a German lady, and uh, she, you know we may be working with them uh, overseas as well. Okay, so this is kind of a look at taking a look at what we've done, what we're doing, where we're going. Okay, um, we we got our first angel investor. As I mentioned, we got the the, the nuggets developed. Uh, we have uh, the AI filed for that. Um, and our go-to-market strategies, what I mentioned, we're going to start, you know, working with, we're working with the mayor's office, we're acquiring POs, which I said from U.S. food service type, uh, target markets. Again, we're talking to Google, we're talking to Disney. Uh, we would like to uh, launch the meal kits in Denmark. Um, and then I'd like to at least uh, fractionally hire some executive people. Um, there's a company uh, called Plantera that JBS, which is the largest meat supplier in the United States, 
closed down last fall and they had an exceptionally talented group of people working at Plantera, which was their plant-based arm. And I'm working with the woman who was in charge of getting all the, um, all the, whatever you need to, to sell overseas, all the certifications and whatever else. So she's, she's where we're working very closely. That's why I'm saying we're going to be launching Denmark, Sweden, because she, and, and actually our product is already approved. The Massilia product is already approved in Denmark. Okay. Um, and again, we'd like to get the branding out. Um, we're going to start grassroots. Um, but, you know, again, we're, we're, we're building, you know, and I, I don't want to spend a lot of money on, on, on marketing at first, because I know it's a big budget item, but uh, we want to put it in there and we're, we want to have some sales before the end of this year. And next year, we're, we have three lines of the shelf stable. We're going to have Mexican, Asian, and Italian, which are the top three um, uh, things that people eat here, eat and order. Um, we're going to launch our refrigerated and frozen products. And uh, we have to, again, we're going to get our certificates and we're going to double our sales next year. Okay. We're seeking um, 1.5 million investment here are all our, what we're looking for and where, what, it, what this money will be going to and how, and how it's going to be dispersed, the, uh, the, the allocation. Okay. It's, um, 10, 10 million cap, 20% discount. And we, like I said, we had, we had an angel investor for 15 K. And this is just a little bit about me, which I'm not going to bore you with, but I've been in New York. I've done 35 years of business development. One of the reasons why I've been having nice discussions with investors is that um, I get this comment over and over. They said, people, they, they have these great ideas, but then you have to go out and sell them. And you have to sell your product. You have to sell your company. And so um, I, I, I've been here for 35 years in business development and sales. I've worked in three other startups where I was head of business development and responsible for revenue streams. Um, I worked with the National Basketball Association. And um, I, was a, I was a travel writer. Uh, I have wanderlust. And, um, and uh, I'm also was a, a franchise owner. So um, I have a, a business background, but primarily a sales one, but it's always uh, relationship involved. So, and again, we're looking for impact um, investors as well. Um, and people who, who uh, can see that the plant-based um, the plant-based market is outspending here, at least in the US, the, what you would call the carnivore flexitarian market by two to one. And so it is, it is growing. And I think what we're doing differently is number one, the type of protein that we're using because it is very versatile. We have yogurt that we also are in the middle of development with. It was on uh, 60 Minutes, which is a Sunday night like news magazine show. And uh, this woman was on with Bill Gates and Anderson Cooper. And they were actually tasting this plant-based yogurt. Now that woman is working for Merlin. And so she's working on Blue Dot's uh, yogurt. So um, that will be coming to market too as well. And it's delicious because I've tasted the samples. <laughs> um, so at any rate, um, and here's just a few other people. Uh, we have our, our operations person. Um, she is fantastic. She knows everything about operations. She, she used to head up a multi-million dollar tech company. Um, and she's, I, I just can't say enough about her. Uh, she's, She's fantastic. Um, and she's very, very, very well qualified as well. Um, and then we have our, our CFO who's been, uh, the reason why he's part of our team too is because we're, again, we're, we're trying to get all this overseas. Like I learned about our VAT, getting our, we're, we are getting that, <laughs> Matilda. And, uh, and also our digital director who's responsible if you took a look at our, um, our, our landing page. So this is just a core group of people. But when you looked at our partnerships, I'm working with those people all the time. So at any rate, um, I'm, I'm very excited to bring this to market because of its versatility um, and the enthusiasm towards it, towards not just plant-based people, but uh, just going to grocery stores and saying, hey, you know, people are starting to ask for it. And um, uh, I think it's only going to grow. I think it's going to grow exponentially. And we have a couple of years of research, market research, and actually the scientific 
uh, research. That I'm a junior food scientist now. So, and here's our advisory board. Um, uh, Ken Lavador, he's actually the head of, he's a fellow of sustainability um, at SD Lauder. Um, and he's, he's uh, been- I'm sorry, he's, it's, not, it's been like 20 minutes now, maybe. I, huh? is, it the last, is it the last slide? Oh, because it's been now yes. a little bit over time, it's 20 minutes. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Yeah. Yes. So we have, I have a very, I have a great group of advisors help me along the way. So thank you very much for listening to me. And if anything, I hope, um, uh, you know, you, 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 you've learned a little bit more about uh, Massilia and we do, uh, we're working with sustainability efforts. We're in lockstep with the United Nations, but thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Great pitch. Uh, okay. I look forward to hearing from the board members and let's keep the order we start with uh, Yasmin, then Adrian, then Juan, and then Owen. So Yasmin, you can you can start to give your feedback and ask your questions. Thank you, Pamela, for the presentation. It was really interesting to hear about it. Uh, could you please elaborate more on your team, especially on the scientific side, because we uh, heard your like core team, but we didn't hear much about the scientific team, and I okay. think it's important. Yeah. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Okay, Merlin Development. Um, because that's all who I deal with there are food scientists. Uh, and they've come from big companies, General Mills, Kellogg's, and they're working there. So um, they, they're they working not only with how to get the mycelia, because it, it's, it's, it's very challenging. Um, it, it's about getting the right texture, which I've learned about, because when I've gotten samples, the texture wasn't there, this, that, and the other. Also the taste too. So the, the food scientists, we go back and forth all the time. And I work with, um, there's either three or four of them that I'm specifically working with, because you know, they have big clients. So uh, I'm very grateful that they're working with uh, the startup. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that we, the, the, the making of these uh, products starts really, believe me, with the food scientist. And then the culinary part of it comes in actually afterwards. So it's it's using the the mycelia and the percentage and, and then it, it gets real technical and I could have you talk to the people about what percentage we use of their PX, uh, TXP. There's three different things that uh, ingredients that come in. One does taste, one does texture, and one's a blocker, bitter blocker. Yeah. So so the, the production is not in-house, the, the mycelium fermentation and also the nugget, right? Right. No. Okay. So no, 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 they're not, they're not, no, they only develop, they don't have the capacity. They can make bench samples, but mm -hmm. they, so we have found a co-man out in Denver. So that, that can handle this. Okay. Yeah, I see. Uh, so other than that, uh, you're focusing on uh, the government and et cetera. You start with the nuggets, right? And mm -hmm. you'll go to the yogurt from there and what would be your perfect client at this point? Um, I, I would a perfect client would be somebody who is ready and, and wants to assimilate, um, mm -hmm. and I mean assimilate plant-based food into the food culture. And I mean mm -hmm. in, the, in, in any in any food culture, but in, in our food culture to be it, it, to begin with and say hey listen i want to take the the alternative i want to take that word out of protein it's just another protein product a high protein product um mm -hmm. so the ideal client would be somebody who uh number one embraces that and number two probably would have um the ideas of of, of where they they think it would they think it would benefit the most as far as uh certain geographic areas here in the mm -hmm. United States, but we're, we, we're also working in, with France too. So, yeah. um, so and, and you may, mean, may I just say, we're going to, we're going to start with the, the ready, um, the ready meals first, mm -hmm. because they don't need to be refrigerated or frozen. Mm -hmm. So that would be, be quicker. Mm -hmm. and, and, and more, yeah. Sorry, please. Oh, and be more cost-effective too. Uh -huh. And uh, what kind of uh, channels are you uh, going to use to reach this client's clientele? Um, well, that's one uh, we're using DOT right now is distribution. And then I'm really learning the, the European market. And mm -hmm. so, <laughs> I, um, oh, and, and it's, um, it's 
Orkla, the company that I don't know if that brings a bell with anybody, but um, so I, I'm hoping to learn a lot about European distribution from them. And, and then in here, we're gonna go Whole Foods East Coast first, because that's where, mm -hmm. where, where Blue Dot is. And then mm -hmm. we're gonna do a strategic rollout. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, for now I'm okay. We okay. can continue with Adrian, yeah. Okay, and listen, if you'd like to be connected to the food science uh, scientists at, at Merlin, I'd be more than happy to. Thank you. Um, great, yeah, first, thanks a lot, Pamela, for the <clears throat> presentation. It was very interesting. Um, actually, biomass fermentation is something we look quite a lot into, right? Uh, at um, at Big Idea Ventures, it's, uh, we see really the potential of, of um, producing analogs, uh, so meat or fish analogs that are very similar to the, the actual uh, thing. So I think it's, it's very interesting. Um, one of my, my main questions um, is really about uh, how you differentiate yourself from the other um, companies that are also building uh, alternative chicken or, or meat uh, using biomass uh, fermentation. Um, so you, you did a big comparison with plant-based foods, but with the other companies doing more or less the same thing as you, is there something really specific that you're doing that they're not doing? Yeah. Um, what's specific and what, what sets us apart is um, what we're not using. The ingredients, the, the preservatives, the type of things that were in the type of chemicals, um, methylcellulose and all that, that, that other companies are using. And that's what I was trying to show by how, my, how many ingredients that we use. So what differentiates us, number one, is that we're clean. Number two, that the protein that we do is, it, it's not only sustainable, but it rejuvenizes the, rejuvenizes the, the uh, soil. Sorry, it was a little tongue-tied there. So, um, uh, so not only sustainability, but it's clean. And, uh, and the versatility, if, you, if really, I know this is, the versatility of this is actually mind blowing. So, um, and I was just trying to show the three, the three different, because there's three different areas. So, um, and also too, we are profit with a purpose. We are in lockstep with the United Nations and the sustainable uh, development goals, which I believe separates us with a few other companies. Yeah, okay. And okay, we're great. also, I'm sorry, and the other thing too, if I just may ask is, uh, we are uh, we are uh, very devoted to diversity in the company. Um, we have African American, the woman that we're working with, France, she's on the autism uh, uh, spectrum. So we're very uh, passionate about bringing a diverse group of people in as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. And uh, my next question is on on how you plan on on. Um... Um, on protecting yourself from, from other companies that might take a similar approach as the one that you're using, because you're using a, um, the shiitake strain, right? which, is, which is a strain that is um, already known. Do you plan on, on patenting the process somehow so that some other yeah. companies do not do not yeah. do the same as you? What's your approach here? Okay, yes. Yeah. So number one, we do have the IP. It's been filed. It was filed a year ago uh, for the Nuggets. Okay, the other thing too is that when other people talk about um, shiitake mushrooms, a lot of them, 90% of them are going to be coming from out west, and they're not the same quality, they're not the same nutrient value as the ones that probably when they say, oh yeah, we use, um, we use shiitake, but they're also talking about using the mushroom, I think most of it, but um, so ours is, uh, when I say the cleanest, it, it's a, a far and above the cleanest, and that's what makes it so versatile. And that's something because I'm like a geeky research person that I, 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 of course, the first thing I did was go see who else was doing that. So, and then I talked to the company I'm working with and they are heads above, uh, they're above the others. And there's nobody, nobody's really utilizing them the way I am. There's big companies that don't, is like use part of that. They will use part of their ingredients for what their bigger products, but not as making core products like we are. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Wait. And and did you um, did you manage to how do you manage to to give a chicken taste to your um your product? Are you using um, natural flavorings from like um yeah yeah okay. flavor houses yes. yeah from the the flavor houses. But then that's why I have our our that, that that's why I told you about the chef because he has a little he has a little secret sauce to it which I can't. Okay, that's fine. You know, but yes, more. we will, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. And my um, final question um, is more about the um, um, strategy. So um, you plan on on entering um, retail in a, in a second step. First of all, you want to address food service and also sell uh, directly to to consumers. I'm assuming it's under your your brand. Yes. Yeah. And um, and um, why do you plan on focusing on on building a brand and also selling to food service at the same time? Because um, it's going to be a lot of resources, right, that you need to spend into like the brand, building a brand, like making it known, uh, being visible to consumers, etc. Um, which which um, which might distract you from like focusing on uh, food service and building relationships with the like um, these other companies so so why doing the two at the same time or do you want to maybe start with one of the two approaches well start with the one and i i know I'm, i i thought about that as i was saying that with the food service approach because we're also looking to do private labeling as well when i talked about the e-commerce that is basically retail and if you saw one of my advisors she's the ceo of a company she specializes that in e-commerce so we're she's going to let me know once we, we're doing the food service, when when the most optimum time is uh, to do that. But yes, I would definitely say the food service would be the first priority because like I said, we're talking with Disney and Google. Um, mm. So it, it, that's gonna be very time consuming, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, great, and thanks. Adrian, I just wanna say, I've seen you in other pitches, so it's nice to finally talk to you. Okay, yeah, <laughs> thanks very much. And thanks a lot also for the, of the answers to the questions. Very interesting. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. They were great questions. I love them. Anyone else? I love questions. Okay, now we have it's uh, Juan who will ask questions. <laughs> okay. Yeah, hi, Pamela. Thank you for your presentation. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a lot of questions, but I have feedback to provide if you, if you allow me. Sure. Because I, as we can only invest or support as a European startups. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me for asking to a lot of questions and I, as I actually can cannot do a lot of things with you. I, how do you feel about it? I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand you, Juan. I apologize. Okay. Are you listening to me properly? Can you hear me okay? Uh, could you just speak up a little bit? Okay, I could, yes. Thank you. Okay, I, 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 as I mentioned, I will provide feedback as we cannot uh, invest or support uh, any American startups. We can only support European startups, okay? Okay. So that's I will provide feedback. Yes. Um, when you talk about uh, the problem, actually at the beginning of your, of your deck, uh, I felt the lack of numbers uh, about the size of the problem, and there were, it was very, very qualitative and not quantitative at all. You didn't mention any cipher, any number there. So for me, it would have been nice to know about uh, all, all the sizes of the problem that you were mentioning. That, that would have been great to really, uh, to really understand how well you know the problem and how good you are into the into the the, the problem, okay? That's that that would have been nice to to to, to have. Uh, also, uh, you uh, you presented the solution before the problem, and then you came back to the solution. So that flow for me was a little bit misunderstanding. Okay. Uh, it was you presented first the the shiitake, the museum, all the roots, the all the mycelium, all the roots, all the the things. Then you came to the problem. Okay, that's the problem ahead, and then you came back to the solution. It felt like you could have saved some time there and go straight to the point in a different approach, probably. Okay. Great um, point, Juan. Beautiful. Yeah, and I saw also that uh, I see, what I see as a great advantage of your technology is the use of only 12 ingredients. That's a huge uh, innovation. That's something that the industry is actually asking, that we have to go to plant-based, but no to hyper-processed food, to ultra-processed food with lots of ingredients. I would find a way to... In, uh, to enlarge that argument, to increase that... To, to 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 bring that argument more uh, more presence into your deck okay. right 
And also when comparing to other mycelium uh, fermenters companies, right? As Adrian said, there's a lot of companies working in this specific field. Uh, and some of them are using a lot of ingredients and some of them are not. But uh, on that comparison table, it would have been nice to have those companies, not the soy or the beans companies doing plant-based from other sources, from other protein sources. Okay. Other, okay. Uh, okay. And then you might, one of the problems, I'm sorry, I'm going straight to the points that I was write, written down, okay? One of the problems that you mentioned was that uh, the competitors were too expensive, right? I yep. remember that. They, and then in the comparison table, your price was the same as your competitor. So I didn't see an advantage there. I didn't see that you were tackling that problem. So I um, felt a little bit disappointed when you mentioned that the, one of the problems was the price. I was hoping that your price was... Uh, was better, right? It was the second lowest. Yeah, but it should have been the second lowest. I, I didn't see a huge difference. Yeah, it was it was a small difference. It was not a huge advantage. It was all around six point eight and seven point five, something like that, right? If I mm -hmm. remember properly. So it would have been nice to have a larger improvement. A larger. If okay. you can manage that, it would be great. I know it's not easy. That's why the prices are what it is. But uh, if that's the point, I, I don't know if I will mention it uh, an advantage. Okay, no, I appreciate that. That's, thank you. Uh, and then this is something personal. This is not something that, but when talking, we're talking about healthier lives through food and new ingredients and stuff. And then you're proposing plant-based nuggets, which is fried food. And we know how healthy fried food is compared to other types of food, right? So. I always have that internal conversation with myself that if we are proposing a new alternative and the nuggets, for example, that are fried, uh, can we can we suggest another product that it that shouldn't be fried, right? That that's okay. but that's something internal and that's something that in the European market I know is different from the American one. Mm -hmm. So that that's just a personal approach on, on, on that. And then I saw, I, I agree completely with the Adrian comments regarding the uh, the food service versus the e-commerce and the, and the branding and all these things. I think it's very relevant uh, uh, to have that. And then I also felt a, a little bit disappointed when you were asking for a million, a million and a half, I, say, I thought. But you were only increasing sales in fifty thousand for the first year. So, what you know that that the scale? Well, that was between now and the end of this year. Yeah, but the, the twenty twenty four, I saw that you were selling a hundred k. Is that right? Or I missed? Yeah. Um, okay. okay. Well, we, we're we're still actually pounding out those numbers. To be honest with you. Um, I, I wanted, I was projecting 200 K, but my CFO said, you know, you'd rather make them happily surprised and disappointed. So I'm like, okay, so perhaps that was low ball a little too much. So that makes a lot of sense. And if I just can just say one thing about the nuggets, they're not, they're not, they're not fried. They're, they're, they're air fried or, or you put them in a toaster oven. Ah, okay. 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 That's okay. Thank you for that. What's <laughs> yeah. uh... And, I don't want to try it either. Good, good. And and the, the last one, uh, the last point that I wrote down was uh, your your food chef, your your chef uh, mm -hmm. that, that you promoted a lot. He's able to create the recipes for you. Which kind of ownership does he have uh, of the recipes and, and which kind of which, which type of ownership do you have of the final recipes? Because it's a he key part none. of the, he has he none. Has none. No. Okay. Okay. Um, and he's, he's no, he's not. He's most of the most of the products are developed by the food scientists. Okay. He's adding the the taste and the text. Well, it, not even the texture actually, because that's with the food scientists. Okay. So he's he's making sure there's a balance between um, uh, certain notes. You know, certain notes of of um, herbs or spices that we're using and making sure that there's a clean finish. So like, for example, in our, our coating, which is gonna be a tempura coating, which is crunchy, 
it's going to have a little bit of a lemon in it for a finish. So these are just very, very subtle subtleties that are making all the difference regarding the taste. And um, we, we did we did do uh, we had sent out to samples to a couple of investors and we got very, very positive uh, feedback as far as that is concerned. So so he's 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 more of a consultant role. We've been working together for a few years. OK. Okay, that, that that's great. Well, that, that was it. Uh, besides that, I uh, I wish you the best. Thank you, Juan. Thank you for the feedback. That was fantastic. I, I will take it all in and, and utilize that. And by the way, as far as numbers, I can send you numbers for days. I I, I left them out because I didn't want to become <laughs> something that was all numbers. I wanted the people to get to the concept, but all those can be backed up with numbers because mm -hmm. of the research that we did and the numbers that were provided to us by the Plant-Based Association of America. So we do have numbers to back up everything. Good, thank you. But thank you, thank you for pointing that out, I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Okay. And the, yeah. and can I just say one last thing? When Juan, yeah. you had mentioned, say a lot of people are dealing in mycelia. Um, there's a differentiation in mycelia. So I just wanted to note, make, note that, and even the fermented mycelia, and especially where it comes from, because it makes all the difference in the world. So that's another differentiating point, um, Adrian, that I wanted to point out, that I pointed out. Yeah, I, I agree. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Juan. And now, uh, Owen, give his feedback. Thanks, Paula, for the pitch. Uh, super interesting. And I'll, I'll try to capture some of the questions that haven't been captured already. Um, but mainly my point, my first point was around the company that you're working with, uh, which is the technology provider, like the, the, the Merlin, if, if I understood correctly. What's the relationship there? Do you license their tech? And you mentioned that they have over 50 patents as well on the process, but then you also mentioned that there's some new IP. Is that under your company or is that yeah. also part of Merlin? Merlin's... No, no, no. What, whatever's developed, I own the Blue Dot owns the IP. Okay. And then uh -huh. and, and then the company, Merlin is the developer, the food developer. So um then that's why they get paid. They get paid. So I own the IP. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, is and this the... on the process or the formulation yeah the, the, yeah yeah blue dot owns all of that okay we don't own it on the actual macelli i want to be real clear on that because mm -hmm. we get that from a company okay so that's merlin as well or some other company no, it's another company okay got it that, and does that okay. yeah yeah and and do you foresee to use other other like uh, types of mycelia, other strains apart from shiitake, or is is it's not something? Oh in yeah, the works? yeah, oh yeah. We're yeah the research in because this is evolving and it's evolving very quickly. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we're we're staying on top of that, but it's got to meet the clean and sustainable. You know, it's and the clean actually is the is a is the hard part. And uh, my question is more related to regulatory, like any strains you will use will be like already food food uh, grade or are you also yeah. researching other novel novel strains that would require regulatory approval? Well, um, there's other strains from a silly that can be used for non-food things. Mm -hmm. And um, the other strains, um, I would actually, I would actually have to have a conversation with the food scientists and see what they're, you know, because that's a good question because they they talk about, there's a lot of, I forget how many uh, varieties of, of mushrooms, but in, in especially in the shiitake, but to maybe there may be other mushrooms, that, uh, other mycelia from other mushrooms that might be um, uh, worth looking into as well. But that's a great point. Yeah. And the, uh... My my last main question is regarding the command that you already have. You mentioned that you have this partnership. Do you plan to scale the production with them, or also build your own plant um, or like a hybrid approach? Given that well, of course, our exit, during, yeah. okay, um, great question. Our exit strategy is to have our own command, and I'd like to have it near Cornell University because they have their whole ag tech and they they do a lot in plant based. You know that they, they do a lot. 
so that that's our exit is to have one there. Um, the one out west, we we got to see what their we're still talking. We'll see what their capacity is. Okay. But they but let me just tell you this: they know about the supplier, so they're very confident that they can work with all of our products that we're developing, which was not easy to do. It's not easy to find it all, but we got it. We got there. Got it. No, no further questions from my end. Okay, thank you, Owen. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you, Pamela. Uh, yes, um, so, yeah, so we can move to the second pitch. Uh, if there are any more questions to Pamela, you can use the, the chat or connect uh, directly on LinkedIn. And uh, now we, we will listen to, um, to the um, second pitch, uh, which is called a Weekly. And it's presented by Paul Cook from the UK. Hi, Paul. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, great to have you here. <laughs> so, if you when you're ready, you can share your your screen and you can start the pitch. Great. Um, Cool. Can anyone see? Yes, perfectly. Great. Right. So we are um, we are weekly. We're doing online groceries with no packaging waste. Um, supermarket shopping causes forty percent of all plastic packaging waste. This is a UK number. I appreciate not everyone in the group is from here. Um, consumers want to shop more sustainably, but it's very difficult. Uh, there's no easy all in one one place solution, and uh, that's what we do. We make it easy for people to buy and consume their weekly shop with no packaging waste at all. So we have, um, currently we have a very linear system for, for packaging. Uh, I'm gonna talk a lot about plastic, but we address uh, glass and tin and and uh, cardboard as well. Um, our system is, is very linear at the moment and shoehorning in circular solutions to this system is, is really difficult. So a lot of current solutions try to just adapt the existing system um, and um, essentially creates cost layers. It makes it quite difficult to make it price competitive. So there are people working on um, maybe writing software for tracking containers, or maybe people are doing um, their washing setup or uh, refilling stuff. Um, but essentially, the the packaging has to make an awful lot of uh, separate journeys, and um, it's a, it create it creates a lot of, of layers of cost. Um, and also, generally speaking, we'll ask the customers to do an awful lot of work. So we need it's a, a new system, really. Um, and that's what we're building. So all our grocery products come in uh, reusable containers that we collect and clean. Uh, we handle operations in distributed hubs. So um, a much simplified uh, journey for the packaging. Um, the way our, our system works is uh, the distributed hubs are... Um, decided by two things so we think we need about 27 for the uk they are based on uh two factors one is how far will an electric van drive and the other is what size and that's about density of the area it's in um, and we're currently operating a pilot or about to launch a pilot in which we're going to learn a lot about that stuff um this is how the system works so consumer signs up to a flexible subscription so this is now a common way to buy food and drink um, but it does need to be quite an organized shop. The reason we're a subscription is one of the most important parts of doing circular stuff really well is you need to be very good at recovery. You need to be very good at collecting things. So um, you can edit your order right up until the day before. Uh, we'll do fulfillment from these distributed hubs. Uh, we will collect empties when we drop off your new stuff. And you basically keep the containers until they're empty. So um, when it comes to products, we think we... we um, even for launch, we're currently looking at about 350 products across most categories. From um, and um, the the consumer experience of it is, you just keep it till it's empty, so you don't have to do decanting, you don't have to do any other sort of container management, change your setup in your kitchen. You just use it until it's empty, and then when it is empty, you put it in uh, the container that we gave it you in, and we collect it next time we drop off uh, your order. Uh, proprietary tech was mentioned early on um we're doing some quite cool stuff to make this work um the the containers themselves need labeling so food and drink come with quite strict labeling regulations and um 
one of the major problems with a lot of circular stuff is you have to be able to label and then delabel things. So we are going to just label straight onto the bottle. We're not going to use plastic paper or glue labels. We're just going to print straight onto the bottles um, and remove them in the in the clean cycle. Um, this little video shows two two bits of tech. One is the tracking and one is the, the labeling. So the scanning and tracking is every container gets its own ID, its own QR code. So it will be track throughout its life. And that also lets you do lots of cool stuff about um, traceability and knowing what's in it and um, who had it and when and for how long and prompting customer reorders if you have them consumer scannable. Um, and then the second thing was the labeling. So straight onto the bottles and cleaned off during the clean cycle. Um, very important because it means we can um, we can we can use different containers for uh, sorry the same containers for different products uh, means you need less containers basically um this is a, a very um interesting space from a revenue point of view so it is a high spend high cadence category um this is a mature number so our mid case model in year five uh this weekly number is at about 250 quid a month um and we think our sort of more loyal customers will be generating more cash than that um grocery is a really high spend category if you can get people to buy it on subscription potentially very lucrative um it's very difficult to do no one has managed to do it yet because i don't think anyone's given people a good enough reason uh, as to why they would shop like that you think losing all the packaging waste from your shop is a good enough reason uh, we have some pre-launch traction so we hope to be launched next month um 750 or so people on the waiting list we are part of a Re London are our London's um, a waste management group. Uh, so they're running a circular test project in a borough that has, or in a village within a borough that has 8,000 households in it, about 25,000 people. And there's a bunch of circular type startups involved. So we're one of those, we're a grocery partner. Um, market size is a, it's an absolute monster. Grocery is, is the biggest of all the, of all the spaces. Uh, you can be enormous without being very big at all. And the frame of reference here in, in the UK is someone like Ocado is very well known, very big, it's a two and a half billion year business and has 1.3% market share and is the 13th biggest grocer. So the um, the scale of the category is enormous. Our, our mid case is, I think, relatively small. It puts us in a sort of comparable place to a lot of the sort of um, food delivery services like Avon Coral or Riverford. Um, and we have versions of obviously a high case where it'd be potentially much bigger and stuff, but we're, we're pitching grocery. We'd like to be a supermarket um, or are going to be a supermarket. Um, so quite unique in what we're doing. And so this is a busy slide. I'm going to talk quite quickly through it, but broadly our competition we've got is um, supermarkets. So I put a card on waitress here because when it comes to own brand products, that's about the price point. Um, shopping with us will be kind of like if you went to a normal supermarket our traditional supermarket and bought mostly branded products is kind of the sort of price point we're at. Um, but we have covered some other things in this list because the way we're executing it overlaps with an awful lot of different types of service. So new types of milkmen, um, uh, the, the veg box delivery services, meal kit things, high streets are waste stores. There are lots of people selling similar overlapping stuff, but no one here doing this yet. There are examples in other countries, the rounds in the States is the biggest one. Um, there's been Peter Pot in Holland who were recently acquired by the guys who washed their kit. Um, and uh, La Tournée in France. There's there's a bunch of them around, or Returner in Australia. Um, no one here yet. Um, it's a really interesting space and has a lot of room in it. Uh, team is myself and Mark. So um, we were co-founders together at Tails.com, who were bought by Nestle. Um, we've also just sort of been in D2C subscription businesses for a while, so I've been in quite a few of them. Um, Mark was also, uh, he's also a startup person. He's a developer, but also a maker. So very hands-on, um, uh, very interesting way of approaching problems. So very good for sort of our container solution and stuff. Um, we have a number of sort of formal partner advisors. So we have, uh, buying, we have sustainability, we have more tech, um, food industry operations, um, all really experienced people with really strong backgrounds. Uh, we also have, you know, cause we've been in startups a while, we have, very strong networks ourselves and sort of the extended network beyond this is is uh, is great our current uh, roadmap and where we're up to we are launching a pilot so talked as mentioned earlier you know we're talking about new system is what we need and um not going to change grocery system overnight but what we're going to do is try and demonstrate that we could so the pilot is funded by a UKRI grant um which is part of Innovate UK UK government grant program um some angel investors we've just got a fund um on board who are going to match the early angel checks 
um we are so we you know we've exceeded the minimum we needed but we would like to be able to go faster hire more people um and be more flexible um so we have um we will take um a little bit more now if if uh, if it's there so we take it up to another 250 there i did total funding so far is over 300 uh, k um and we have a sort of a rollout plan from there so this is a proof of concept pilot which will lead into first big hubs which will then lead into a rollout involving um well it's a modular rollout because the hubs are all sort of not standalone but close to standalone um what's interesting about this thing is I get asked about cost quite a lot and because we're using these distributed hubs the cost is modular so it only scales with success um and so yeah that's kind of where we're up to now we are we started phase one in April uh we think we're launching next month um and so an awful lot of things in flight we're building tech we have uh, well and truly picked our platform and, and we're into that um we uh, sort of just about sorted a site vehicles containers are on the way um we've been testing our labeling kit which is the little demo you saw but we're doing better versions of that um so yeah a lot of things all in flight at once now um and hope to launch very soon and that's us Thank you so much, Paul. Great pitch. I just realized I rattled right? through pretty fast. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so. no, it's uh, nine minutes, 30 seconds. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so let's move on to the Q&A now and we start with uh, Yasmin. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, you know, we see this kind of business models because I think everything is kind of coming back to uh, very how it was. Like we like these local shops now uh, and everything. Uh, my big, My first question is, I think the biggest part of your operation is going to be the cleaning uh, because you will have the containers and the, you will have the meat and everything. So mm -hmm. can you walk me through the cleaning facilities and what kind of control points are you going to be using there? Yeah, so we have our sort of version one of our sort of hub layout. I have a little 3D drawing. Um, it's not quite ready to share yet, but um, we're working with a... Uh, food technician who's going to do our sort of HACCP and health and safety checks and stuff to make sure we're all okay. We've run through it, uh, you know, using drawings and stuff. So we think we're okay in terms of this is going to be safe and viable and everything. Um, we expect to be using a little tunnel washer to start with. Um, the so making things clean is not that hard making things dry is hard. Um, so like that's a so what's interesting is we have a few things where our in our pilot, we wanted to test and learn a lot about a lot of different stuff, mostly containers, what a consumer's like, but also what works operationally. Um, and that includes things like, you know, the deft stuff, like will it stack properly? Will we have space? Do we have room to put all these containers while they're in transit? Um, but also things like how hard are they to clean? Do they scratch? Do they taint? Um, and what's safe? And what safety checks do we need to do and stuff? So we we aren't going to necessarily decide early the actual materials for the containers, but what we do have is a couple of principles around which we're going to do them. So thing, the obvious stuff like end of life recyclability, which is one of the reasons we're using QR codes instead of RFID, because it's easy. It doesn't, doesn't impact recyclability. Um, we also don't think uh, we... We don't want to put any food in plastic so we want to make sure it's if it's food contact material it is glass or or stainless steel um and and that's it in terms of the container stuff we will test a lot of the things and see what so we'll see what people like so um the gen the basic process is it will come into us it will get scanned in um it will get cleaned and it will get stored one of the parts of our uh, early layout is a storage room um we're not sure yet whether it needs positive pressure it might um and uh, so the food technician is going to help us work through the um, steps involved in making sure all that is safe and validation, make sure the thing is clean, it's cleaning properly for everything. And um, we, you know, things like how long can a thing be clean before it needs cleaning again, before you have to use it. So maybe, you know, you can keep it for a couple of days before you have to wash it again and use it. So um, we're working through the steps. We think we're we're okay with the layout we've done. And now we need to just set up and get certified and stuff. We're going to be doing organic as well. So we'll do organic certification and been learning all about that and how, you know, even if you, even things like fruit and veg, you have to touch the non-organic stuff first and then the organic stuff and, and then do clean down and stuff. So um, yeah, we, we're working with people who are very experienced in the area. The person who's actually going to do this stuff for us is, um, she's great. She's uh, not only done D2C food business before, but she's worked in pubs and restaurants and um, and shops as well. So she's uh, really, really good and has covered a lot of different territory. Did that answer your question? 
Yeah, uh, and also about the cleaning agents. Are you going towards natural cleaning agents? Are you going to use just water or some other laser technologies? Like, I don't know, ultrasound, anything? <laughs> we have looked at using lasers to clean. It's, <laughs> it's interesting because we, we're going to laser etch and um, yeah. we might well end up with a laser department, the amount of laser -y type things we think we need. Um, but the um, we, we've, we've looked at a few different um, things that we want we would like everything to line up with the general ethics of how we're the sort of zero waste and, and stuff. So um, ideally, yes, cleaning has a golden triangle of heat, chemicals and time. So it depends a little bit on speed and, and stuff. Most of the most of the cleaning stuff we've been looking at has water recapture, it has heat recapture um, and the drying execution depends a little bit on what materials are being dried. Um, the reason plastic is so hard to dry is it doesn't retain heat. So when you come to evaporate the water off of it, the 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 water just doesn't want to because the plastic is cold. So um, yeah, we've we've been looking at a few different things. Um, we would like it to be as eco as possible. Most of the products we will sell that are for cleaning and stuff will be very eco friendly. So it makes sense for us to be using them as well. And uh, when it comes to stock management, because I think you'll be handling, uh, you'll be preparing everything a day before. And I think it will be hard to source these materials that you're going to sell. And then you need this vehicles. So how the uh, stock handling will be happening and what is the logistics art? Uh, what's the situation with logistics? Do you have an in-house uh, software for that or uh, how did you deal with that? So oh, this is two questions. No, it's cool. These are good questions. So I, I, I've, as I smashed through the presentation, I realized there's a few things I didn't talk through, which um, I should have perhaps covered. There's so, um, starting with logistics, so Karen, who's one of our advisors, um, was one of the other founders of Tails. She wrote the software that powers their warehouse. So sophisticated pick and pack software that is scan every step and has batch traceability and stuff built into it. Um, so we will have um, a lot of input from her and it's so she's currently working on the system already. Um, and so we will have our own software to manage uh, the things. So the actual, so things like container traceability software is not um, completely insane to do. It's just difficult to make sure you do it right. Um, so uh, the, the stuff we she's built before in, in the pick and pack has been designed to be done by or pick and pack by you we used to call it mr 3 a.m so you're a really tired picker in the middle of the night who can't concentrate not allowed to make any mistakes so you have to design a system that facilitates that and um so yeah so she's great and obviously mark worked with her at, at tales on that stuff as well so um when it comes to sort of software that's how we're, we're thinking about it when it comes to the operations of the whole thing in-house something i didn't mention um before which might be a slightly tangential point but it's probably one that's really worth making so um People forget how expensive throwaway packaging is. If you go to the shop and you buy your groceries, 10 to 40%, depending on what you buy, 10 to 40% of the cost is the packaging. So you are now the proud owner of, you spent hundred quid, you're the proud owner of 40 quid of plastic. And um, you know, you've bought this plastic that's now gonna last thousands of years and the stuff that was in it lasted seven days. So now you're gonna pay someone else again to come and collect it from you. So there's a hidden cost in groceries where you, you pay a, a collection service. And then we all pay when that gets thrown into the ocean or into the incinerator. And so there's like three times that you pay for throwaway packaging. And so um, what's interesting with the, so with the reusables is that depending also again, what it is, um, it can pay back really quickly when it's just, if you're just talking about container versus container, um, some of the soaps and glass bottles, soap and plastic bottles, for example, on the first use, it's broken even. Um, and some other stuff obviously takes longer. And so when you think about the cost of the containers in a per use, then um, all you need to do with your operations. So we have to do a bit of filling, a bit of cleaning and, and that stuff. And the budget we have for that is basically the gap in what you save on reusing the container again and again. So um, we've we've done a few things with our operations that make it a bit slick. Um, well, the idea is to keep it quite tight so we won't hold an awful lot of stock. Um, quite a few of the things, especially early on, would be from wholesalers. So we will have a lot of transient stock. It will be in and out overnight. So we don't need shelf space for it. The footprint of the, of the hubs can be quite small. Um, the stuff we do hold in stock, it depends on what it is. Um, when we're running every day, fruit and veg is a tight two day rolling stock. Um, we will hold cleaning products and, and personal care products, but not masses of it. Uh, so it depends a little bit on, on which products. Uh, some of the stuff 
uh, in and out very quickly. But it means our sites can be quite small. We also stock a relatively small range, so 2,000 SKUs in a mature hub, which is basically like Aldi. Um, the idea is great coverage without going really deep into each range. If you look on our site for milk, you will find one blue milk, one green milk, one red milk, and that will be it. And But they'll be sourced from somewhere local, which is quite nice. The thing about the hubs is you can go to local suppliers. Um, Whereas, you know, I mean, you shop on Ocado and there is 55,000 products. Nobody needs to choose from that many products when they're doing their grocery shopping. It's crazy. So, um, yeah, so keeping the stock count, the SKU count low is, is also quite important for, for making things efficient. So, Thank you. I mean, I have questions, but I'd like to uh, leave the floor to other uh, members. So thank you, Paul. Always happy to uh, chat some more. So. Thank you, Yasmin. And uh, okay, let's uh, go to the second um, panelist with Adrian. Yes. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot for for the presentation, Paul. That was that was very interesting. Uh, my questions are, are mostly around the the consumer um, that you you're targeting. So, um, do you have an idea of your um, buyer persona? Yeah, uh, we do. Hold on a second. I'll show you. Uh... Actually, the persona slide I've got in one of these other decks is a little bit busy, but essentially busy parent. Um, we have two, a primary and a secondary busy parent first. Uh, wants to be more eco-friendly. The kids are learning about eco in school. They just don't have time. Um, and the uh, secondary one is a, a retired couple. So people who are able to shop in a more organized way, have the money to do it, but just can't go to all the different shops to to shop in a more eco-friendly way so our early target is this um and we will find out very quickly if we're right when we launch yeah okay okay and so if i understand correctly um so focusing on the busy parents the the pain point here that you're addressing is that um these parents they want to to eat um um, like high quality uh, fruits and vegetables etc but they just don't have the time to 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 um, to go to these different places um and so this would allow them to 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 purchase their their um, food from one source only a bit more than that so it would allow them to buy their grocery shopping from one source with no throwaway packaging waste so the idea is like we're you know you don't have any trash after you've after you've run out your groceries so uh, mm, yeah we wouldn't have any like bit. empty bins is kind of the end goal although i think ultimately we'll we'll maybe be able to cover 80 percent of a shop um because once you get into that last 20 percent the tail of products you require for that is very long um but the at launch we think it's about 40 percent of the shop so it's more that like you know I, 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 this is in a way me like i have two small kids and i want to do better for the planet and it's very difficult to find the time to do things properly and i know it's possible to shop zero waste but the effort involved is ridiculous so mm. And so, and so, really, the pain point uh, then here that that you're addressing is to have too many plastic bags, uh, right? And you're trying to make something that is a like a, a gesture that is sustainable, that is good for the planet, and yeah, that's that's sustainable. And so, is this pain point um, enough uh, to convince to convince busy parents uh, who who always have uh, who already have it alone in their plates to change completely the habits and move to a new service uh, where they also need to to plan one day ahead right uh, to, to to order and 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 yeah basically completely change their um their food um purchasing habits yeah it's a very fair question so we think so obviously but um <clears throat> so with the habit thing there's a couple of things i guess the um the main the main shift in habit is the organized shop Apart from that, it would be very similar to shopping online groceries anywhere else. The main difference is an organized shop and a lot of there are businesses here that show that people are happy to shop like that. And uh, so, you know, Abel and Cole and Milk and More and a couple of new sort of generationally, there are a few sort of modern milk, like modern milkman is one. There's a few sort of milkman style businesses popping up um, and what we would have called veg boxes here. So Riverford Organic and, and places like that. Dalesford is another one here. Um, there are uh, other examples of food in this way. So the meal kits, Gusto and Hello Fresh, and these guys are, you know, Mintel count those guys in grocery shopping now. So the sort of organized shop in a sort of D2C, sort of flexible subscription way, we think we think is now well understood enough. We think there are enough people who would do it. Um, what we've really tried with the, the change in habit thing with the friction is that um 
we we think we've got it to a place where the only real difference in the use experience is that when you finish your product, instead of throwing it in the bin, you throw it in our bag to come back to us. So um, let's say you had, uh, so let's say you have your tomatoes and you buy them in the supermarket, they come in a cardboard tray with a film around it. So you use it in the fridge and it's a bit messy in the fridge. It's like half open and everything's squishing it and in the drawer and stuff. Um, when you finish it, the film goes in the bin, the cardboard goes in the cardboard recycling, and that's your end of thing. Whereas with us, you would have a container that we think will keep the tomatoes fresher for longer. And then when you're finished, the container just goes back into our bag. And next time we come with your next order, just the things that are finished so far, we're going to pick them up. If you've got something you haven't finished yet, you just keep it till next time. So the idea is like reduce the friction of the use right down to basically the organized shop and remembering to put the stuff in our van and not put it in the recycling and that's mm -hmm. it um and you know with the containers themselves we will use a lot of off the shelf stuff when we're doing this testing early but the um the goal is in it you know towards the end of the pilot year to go and redesign the system so then we learn as much as we can from customers what do they care about what do they not like they didn't like we used glass for this they wanted metal for that they, you know the thing was too heavy or too light or scratched or whatever and um take that and then and make a system for ourselves and that system would be obviously clever operationally stacking and stuff but also um real real opportunity to design for use so when you design for reuse the experience of the product can be so much better make things last for longer keep them fresher put pouring spouts measuring lines make them nice and easy to hold make them stack nicely in cupboards but as people are using the products they literally the idea is it goes when you unpack your shop it goes in the same place in the cupboard as your current stuff it goes in the fridge in the same place so habit wise keep that to a minimum there's sort of change involved there because so many of the circular stuff or the reusable stuff now zero waste stuff is buy some jars change the way you do the stuff make sure you decant when you get home this is high effort right and so we want to keep it as there is a there is a thing with even with some of the products we're selling we're looking at some of the products and they're almost too eco in terms of um they're just a bit weird but i you know so i use toothpaste tabs for example and I, you have to chew them and then you brush your teeth and i think a lot of people would find that quite strange but you know it's great because it doesn't come in a tube um but there are versions also in between so we're looking at paste that comes in a tin for example um mm. because we don't want to have double chance to weird people out <laughs> so lucky we just want to make it so that it's as normal as possible but no throwaway packaging so working mm -hmm. hard on getting that right early on so. yeah okay okay great um great thing so for um yeah for describing it uh, a bit more uh, i have I had also one question on the unit economics so um, i don't know if you've done really deep analysis of, of the unit economics of such a model because and um, you already know it's a type of business that's very very, very tight on on margins mm. um and so each decision is going to have a, an impact on you know on cost and profitability eventually right you mentioned also the the cleaning which is in itself a challenge uh this is going to be the logistics as well and and um and everything linked to that so i don't know if you've done a deep analysis of of what would be a typical margin of such a such a model yeah so we have um because a lot of the stuff um we're working with isn't necessarily you know massive big brand stuff and it means our price positioning is a little bit in line with the sort of own brand in a premium supermarket or a branded product um we think there is real scope for very very good margins later um if we are if we price in that sort of territory um our working margin based on a blended basket mix we think early on is about 35 percent and we think in year five it can be up above 60 but that is going to take some work um and that's what helps us support the other stuff but uh, like you said the subscription economics is what makes it really interesting so if you can get people onto subscription mechanic for this kind of purchase where it is high high frequency high spend and potentially good margin as well then there's potentially a lot of money to be made um this is the sort of so I've referenced a lot of other sort of food delivery services and stuff. We've done now a number of D2C subscription businesses and uh, this side of it, we think will do well, just because of our backgrounds and experience in terms of like how you do a subscription platform, the subscription engine. We're building a subscription engine separately to you know, not using a 
Shopify plugin or anything. Um, we've uh, we've worked through previously all the sort of daft stuff you get with a subscription, like you know, um, delivery challenges in flats versus houses, and cancellations and pushbacks, and holidays and skip deliveries, and and how you handle all this kind of stuff. So very well versed in sort of mechanics of subscription commerce, but also um, like you said, the the sort of the first I think it's the first four orders are really what matter in terms of landing the customer. And then after that, everyone who's still a customer after four orders is kind of going to behave the same. They're all pretty loyal and uh, you can kind of count on that revenue recurring. So we have done a pretty deep dive into how a subscription model works. Not going to go into great detail now, but happy to share it. Um, and we've got, uh, so in the, the actual model is built on a subscription mechanic, it uses cohorts, it churns them and stuff. Um, and we've done the unit economics in the same way. Um, yep. the, the model is the first thing I did. And I then had to do everything else because if it works, it will fly. Um, so like it's, but you know, uh, I, the first version of the model I shared with someone I had to dumb it down and make it worse because it looked too good so it's like um, so i i think the commercials are potentially excellent um margin matters a lot in what we're doing in the buying and selling margin but the 35 percent blended mix is a real number based on the 35 suppliers we have lined up to do the 350 launch products so um for us it's about the mix across the categories there is some stuff you just don't make money on but you have to sell it if you're a supermarket milk i'm looking at milk mostly when i say that but um there's uh there's real scope in some of the other areas to make ridiculous margin so it balances out and we're working with a blended average for now so mm, yeah okay okay great um thanks um thanks a lot for your answers uh, paul i also let uh i know and ask their questions great thank you good questions thank you Adria. okay um juan do you have some question or feedback? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Adil, and thank you, Paul. Very clear and very needed, these, these kind of solutions. I, I actually have the same doubts that I ran uh, before. So I, I will fall, I will focus my questions on the following six to 10 months on the pilot phase. Mm -hmm. Right, I really, I, I, I really like that you can elaborate a little bit more on that. Which are your key assumptions that you need to uh, to solve uh, with that pilot because uh, you have logistics, you have sales, you have return rates, uh, et cetera, which, which are the main assumptions? So I have a <laughs> quite a lot of assumptions. My model has 92 inputs or something. So like uh, it's a, we, we did work through really the detail, um, but obviously, so we're in a place now where we're transitioning from a made up model to a real one. Um, so currently working through the, what things actually cost and what we're using, the, the pilot is going to be pretty startup in a lot of ways, like, you know, the tunnel washer will be a secondhand one and stuff like that. We're going to rent the van and things. Um, the, for me, the thing that matters most is will people use it? Like, will people use it on a very basic level? And does it make sense? Like, do they, I think they will engage on the idea. The world is on fire and people want better options. I I want to know if it's going to be too much change. I don't think it will be. But my, for me, the main thing is that will they use it? So this covers a whole bunch of different things, not just that we'll see it in our retention rates and stuff. I think the most things I will learn is when I'm doing the deliveries and I meet people on the doorstep and ask them about it and what mattered and what they liked and what they thought and what would they do differently? Because the stuff is going to matter are things like... Um, you know, were the containers easy to open? Did they get cold when they touched them from the fridge? Where uh, was it like, uh, we have a return bag, where did they put it? Did they put it outside with their other recycling stuff or they kept it inside and did they have room for it? You know, like, you st so stuff like this are very conscious of and a lot of the early sort of feedback we've, or the customer development stuff we've done has been focused on this, like, would you use it <laughs> really? Um, and then there's like a whole bunch of other stuff that, that goes with that. We've done some, We've done some basic testing on marketing. We've done some social. We've done some flyering. Obviously, flyering has to be seed paper or very eco-friendly. Um, we've done some testing where we've been able to extrapolate an early CPA. Um, the marketing side of it is most is my background as well. So I've done a lot of that stuff. Um, and um, yeah, so for me, the I I think things like the platform, there will be bugs. We'll fix them. Uh, things like the use experience, bugs will fix them. We've done a lot of that stuff before. From my experience of launching something from the start, uh, the thing that 
caught me out last time that I was surprised by was how quickly we needed to hire a customer service person uh, because it overwhelms you and you can't do anything else. Uh, you just end up answering customer service questions, um, especially early when, when the thing is new. Um, but for me, it's that real, like, we are doing this pilot to take customers on a design journey with us. And we're launching a pretty basic version of it, but it does need to be reasonably good because otherwise it would be pointless. Nobody would, nobody's going to spend the time doing it if it doesn't if it didn't sell enough things. You know, so 40% for me is an okay mental threshold of that's enough stuff that people will think it's worth the effort. It's going to make enough of a difference to the waste they're generating and they'll think they're helping enough. And we sell enough things for them not to be doing loads and loads of different shops and things. Um, I don't think it will be hard to get people to try it. I'm just curious about that first interaction and, and they use it. So um, that's my, I said sort of really vague answer to quite a specific question. We've done a, a lot of work on the inputs and what matters. Um, a lot of them we've validated already. Things like what we think containers will cost and stuff. We've done a lot of that work. Uh, we, you know, we've been testing things like this crazy thing we're doing with labels, which nobody else does. It, partly because it's very difficult and partly because there's no point unless you're doing what we're doing so like it's a you know if to dynamically label directly onto stuff and then clean it and the clean process is not really relevant in any other space if you label with ink onto a container you are generally going to uv cure it and there's loads of people doing that already that's different um so there's stuff like that that's uh hard but we're you know we have skill set to do it and we've done that with labels in previous uh, clever d2c stuff and things and so those technical things i'm much less worried about i just want to know if people what people think so yeah yeah i completely agree with that with those assumptions i, I believe that the technical you can actually solve it with more time money or more minds on it but you know you can never change a consumer behavior in an easy way you know mm. and i have another another brief comment uh, regarding that, I saw you were a big corp pending. I saw the logo over there. Yes, I was and very fast and I didn't say it. Yes, it's there. Yeah, you didn't mention it, and I, I'm I'm very into that community, so glad to see that. And I think you should mention it because it gives you uh, a methodology that elaborates all the parts of the company and it helps you to structure the company in an impact way from the very beginning. So I, I would definitely would have liked it that more. Yeah, I really agree with that. I actually, so when I went through the, with the pending, they don't, they don't check it, but you still have to fill out the form and uh, <clears throat> couldn't believe how much non sustain like non sort of environmental stuff there was uh, just great ways of, you know, how you should run everything. And I, that, that's the thing I liked the most because the other stuff we're going to do it anyway. So this stuff is like, you know, I thought it was great. So. Yeah. It helps the structure of the company in a very professional way from the beginning so kudos on that that's it from my side congrats and um, yeah if you need any support or any help i think we would go support you in, in the near future great so please contact me on linkedin and I will, we can talk yeah sounds great all right thank you juan and now we have owen concluding <laughs> yes, uh, thanks, Paul, for the articulate pitch and the mindful of time. Um, I only have a brief couple of ones. Um, so you mentioned uh, you have uh, over 300 or 350 products, kind of, uh, as we mentioned already in these questions, like it's more of a logistics and operations business. So how do you ensure standardization across like the processes that are needed across the different types of products that you have, like from milk to, of course, like fruit or other other stuff that you have yeah so in the early days uh everything is squished into quite a small space so like we've worked through it we figured out we haven't done quite the you know the tape on the floor and the sort of moving like the pretend one yet we've done something similar um so in the early days everything is quite close together and nothing is mm -hmm. super scalable the pilot is very deliberately like that um there is no point in building that scalable stuff yet um but uh yeah so we've we've worked through how it works, how the flow goes, how fast it will be. We have sort of assumptions around picking speeds and stuff. A um, lot of discussions about when and how you do things like the labeling, like, and, and when you pick, did you pick on the fly? Do you pick it in advance? That sort of stuff. Um, so we've worked through it in, in what I would describe as a very good level of detail. Um, but the sort of, when you talk about things like standardization, um depends a little what, what you mean so do you just mean like um 
ensuring we're safe and everything is done in a, a normal that that will be covered by the um the food technicians doing a HACCP for us which will cover yeah. those processes okay. um and we'll you know we'll have to follow them very closely obviously um and we you know the last thing we want to do is be unsafe so we'll be very very careful um and particularly things like allergens and and what space mm -hmm. for what kind of products um we're doing some work on uh cross-contamination containers as well making sure things can be cleaned well enough to hold anything else kind of stuff um and that applies to allergens and also applies to uh food and non-food stuff there's some containers if we're clever about it potentially you could use for all kinds of stuff uh, just whatever's mm -hmm. up next kind of thing you know exactly um, so um when it comes to the containers in the early days especially there will be so much stuff being tested um that standardization of containers is not it's not going to be a thing um but later obviously we want to do a lot of clever things we have a lot of really interesting ideas about how you scale a container system that's just yours um there are variations of uh people working on things like you know uh, universal container systems which just in the sort of space in general almost impossible to get everyone to use one but our idea is that we have one that other people come and use when they when they sell through us so um and some interesting things about you know like some people it's uh you know we, we can do clever things with that printing where we can use logos and other stuff to bring it to life to the point where even if if we saw say the milk from a local farm who pasteurized on site we can call out the farm in the label because we can just change what's in the label whenever we want so um yeah but in the early days a lot of testing of the different things so a lot of variety mm -hmm. and in terms of the reuse cycles you mentioned steel and and glass uh, how, how many times can each of them be reused I and see also Sorry, go on. <laughs> so you're finished. No, no worries. And uh, just a related question in terms of the containers, how do you deal with any missing containers from the users? Do they have to pay, of course? Or uh, two good questions. Uh, I've seen steel cited four thousand uses. Uh, I think Returner in Australia say four thousand for their stuff. Um, most reusable things here use polypropylene, which is crazy considering how much of it is food based. Um, mm -hmm. And that early rule from us is like i i just have this it's a bit of a personal view and i read a lot of this stuff but we just don't know enough about plastic and leaching and migration of materials and what chemicals are coming off and where they're going and stuff and a little bit like asbestos 40 years ago it's the most wonderful material but oh my god it's killing us sort of stuff um i feel a little bit like plastic is a bit like that when it comes to food um i might be entirely wrong but i would rather be on the safe side of that and um the other you know glass has been around for a very long time and is in that and safe and um so yeah I, I, most people using polypropylene say 200 uses um that's what we put into our life cycle analysis we did when we applied for the grant um we <clears throat> we think it's probably more for most things depends on how much care you take with them um we think a lot of the stuff should be pretty durable um depends what kind of glass we use um and there are different reasons you do different ones for different things um and even the steel i think it depends on there is subtlety in the grading and you know, which types of steel you choose to use and things so um <clears throat> and you know there are some really interesting things about how you do caps we have some really cool ideas about how you solve caps i would love to not use triggers and pumps when you're talking about sprays and stuff because there's you know tr trigger spray has six parts and a tube and a spring and it's very difficult to disassemble and recycle um even if it says it's recyclable it's really never going to happen kind of stuff um so we have some really cool ideas about how you do that better um so yeah uh i think it'll be you know, well over 200 but um for the steel and the glass in the thousands potentially um depends a little bit on on an awful lot of fun of things but so i've seen return a quote i think i think it's four thousand for steel for the stainless steel so um a lot <laughs> but it's more it's a bit more expensive up front as well so it balances up you know. perfect and with re with regards to the customers and any missing containers how do you deal with that mm, the um a lot of people do a deposit scheme um not not a new idea a lot of old mm -hmm. models. but I've seen here uh people who so Abel and Cole used to run a reusable system where they required a 10 pound deposit and then they just cancelled the mm -hmm. deposit. I think it was okay. a problem with barrier we because we're tracking all the containers we'll know what you've got um we would then 
if you don't give it back, we'll be nudging you and nudging you and eventually we'll charge you. Um, we don't yet have an idea of setting rules for things like you can have 30 at the most or, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, or, you know, this thing has been expired for two months. Why do you still have the container and this sort of stuff? Um, but it's a more a nudge and then a charge. Um, some discussions around whether you need to hold something on a card for that or not, um, which is kind of the same as a deposit, so I don't particularly want to. But um, I think that's one we will find out. Uh, that is my starting point, and then I'm willing to change it depending on how it goes. Um, Perfect. Thanks. Thanks for that. Thanks again, Paul. And that's that's it from my end. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, so this was the final pitch for the, the night. Um, thanks uh, again, uh, everybody, for, for joining. Uh, I will be sharing the recording with all of you and the contact list, um, probably tomorrow already. Um, there will be also links to everyone's LinkedIn, so it will all uh, be in your inbox soon. Um, so usually I do a, a round table at the end. Uh, and ask the board members if they have some final thoughts or like maybe a last question or some anything else to add. We can take it from the from the last one from Owen and go this way. Nothing, nothing further to add from my end. I think it was super interesting once again, and uh, that's okay. that's it from end. Great, thank you. I'm so glad that you could join and uh, let's be in touch for the next one. And uh, Juan, do you have some more comments or? No, I'm saying thanks oh, for the invitation okay. again. Yeah, we, we had a lot of time with each one of the startups. So it was yeah, great, great. <laughs> Thank you for joining. Uh, Adria? Um, yeah, okay. same. Okay, <laughs> okay, all right. Thanks. Also, all thanks, right. Uh, thanks again for the invitation okay. and, and very happy to join the, the next one as well. Cool. Okay, thank you. And thank you for staying a little bit over time also. I appreciate that. And Yasmin, what did you think of the event? It was your first. First one with the oh, it was really nice. Thank you for inviting and thank you, Paul and Pamela, for the these amazing presentations. So nothing further from my side as well. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much for joining. And uh Paul and Pamela, thank you for your pictures. Do you have something more to say? Or I just thank you for the time and the thank invite. You the yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Appreciate yeah. it. Um, okay. Really thank thoughtful. you. So great to have you, and we'll be in touch. Thank you so much. So have a, have a good uh, evening, everyone, and um, talk to you soon. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.